Hi, I'm Tom Hoskins, editor of Mining Journal, and I'm here with Richard Spencer, who's the CEO of U308 Core, which is a uranium junior in, uh, with a project in central Colombia. Hi, Richard, how's it going? Very well, thanks, Tom. How are you doing? Well, good, thank you very much. Um, now, clearly, there's been a lot of interest in the uranium space recently. The price has been on a bit of a tear since the, the late summer. Um, maybe you could just kick things off by explaining a little bit why that is. Um, it's been a long time coming. I mean, it's been a 10-year bear market. Um, but more importantly than that, I think it's the net zero that's driving it. I think even the politicians who are making all these outlandish commitments, or I shouldn't say outlandish, they're very aggressive commitments to net zero, turning around and realizing, hey, well, where is all this power going to come from? Where is this clean power? Um, what, are, what are the sources? And, you know, we're all into renewables and, and all that, but it's got to be supported by nuclear. Um, without nuclear, these net zero goals are just not attainable. So I think that that is the main driver. And I think even the politicians are getting it. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm just thinking from from our perspective in the UK and looking um, just across the channel in France, that there's there's a little bit of um, an issue, should we say, with with building these things when they're at a large scale. But I mean, the, the, you know, there's a lot of talk of small nuclear react, small modular reactors. Even um, I mean, how much of a factor do you think they will play in in growing the nuclear well, sector? Yeah, I, I I think that they are going to be the fundamental drivers of of the nuclear resurgence. Um, you know, they're all passive uh, safety systems, so it's very difficult for something to go wrong with them. And you know, the the fact that they're modular. I, I mean, you know, there there are two projects in Siberia in Russia that mining projects, and in, in fact, that are going into production because of the availability of small modular reactors. The Russians in two um, different gold, uh, well, uh, the, the one's a gold deposit and the other one's gold copper, and, you know, they, they're huge deposits. These things are being put into production thanks to floating uh, nuclear reactors. So these are small modular reactors that are mounted on boats that are, are offshore, connected to, to the mining sites and the adjacent towns with, with cables. And, you know, the, these are going to be game changers. Um, and, you know, that's, that's one of the first examples of a small modular reactor driving nuclear. So, you know, it, it replaces the hydropower. We, we're all looking for um, clean energy at the moment. But, you know, the hydro is great, but it has a, a big social impact and all the rest of it. Whereas a small modular reactor, most people wouldn't even know that it was, it, it was there. And then, you know, the other thing that's hugely important about the small modular reactors is the concept of being able to put them where a coal-fired power station was. So you shut down the coal-fired power station, but you use all the infrastructure, the fact that that power station was connected to the grid, you just replace it with a small modular reactor, and then you're feeding this, this constant stream of energy into, in, into the grid using the existing uh, infrastructure. And I think, I think the small modular reactors are gonna be the real drivers to, um, to, to nuclear in the, in the future. Yeah, I mean, you, you talk about the, you know, using existing coal fire power plant infrastructure. Is, is that, I mean, how do they fit in with, with the intermittency thing, you know, you, you, with, when, you, when you're talking about using it um, when, when there's no wind or no solar, that kind of, that kind of thing? Yeah, I, I think it's it's what everyone always says about nuclear. It is the one thing that's that's constant. Only on very rare occasions do do the systems go down. And um, you know, I, I, I think that these these concepts of tying a, um, a a power clean power generating unit to nuclear to provide through a small modular reactor to pro provide that base load power. And you know, in, integrate that with the wind and, and solar and battery systems and all that. I think it just you know it provides the the, the backbone for um, to to make sure that that is a, a a solid power system. You don't want the whole system going down if the the weather is bad or whatever. And so you know, the nuclear is, is absolutely fundamental to that. So you know, it's 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 a key component and a sort of backbone of 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 these combined systems, which I think is the way forward. Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I find it fascinating that you kind of have these countries like, I mean, like Germany, who who've been very anti-nuclear over the past sort of decade and had their plans to to phase out. But 
it feels like the kind of tide is turning and that even some of the more hardline environmental groups are realizing that you know we need something to keep the lights on I, th I think so. And, and you know, even with Germany, I think that there's a bit of a change in, in uh, perception there. Uh, France, you know, went sort of neutral on nuclear at 75% at of their energy being provided by nuclear went a little bit sort of uh, neutral on it. And, and now they, they're talking about getting it going again. And, and, you know, obviously the UK and China and all the rest of it. Um, but yeah, and, and, you know, they, I, I think the the, the transportation infrastructure is, is really exciting. And, and you know, the, the, the mining companies um, talking about uh, green steel um, produced by hydrogen as opposed to, to coal and that kind of thing. And I, I you know, and, and, and part of that whole story is the marine transport system. I mean, you know, the, the big freighters and the container ships, they spew out an enormous amount of um, greenhouse gases, thanks to the that you know that horrible bunker fuel that they they burn. It's got so much sulfur dioxide and and nitrous oxide and all the rest in it. In it, and you know there's this drive and and race on to to have some of these ships powered by uh, ammonia. Um, and you know, look, I mean that's that's got to, it's it's its own issues. Ammonia is is only half as energy dense as as diesel, so you need lots of twice the volume to drive the ship. But um, you know, it, it it is greener. But you know, what people forget is that you know they see the the concept of um, the the ammonia driving the ship and and driving the motors of the ship, but. But you know, there's a question before that: Where is the power going to come from? The, the the clean power to generate that ammonia, which is a you know pretty energy intensive um, uh, process. So you know, it's it's fantastic to see um, people paying attention to the the, the big ships uh, because of the pollution that they 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 generate. But you know, it all comes back to what are you going to power that fuel with? And, and you know, the obvious answer is, is a small modular reactors tied in with, with wind and solar and, and tidal power or anything else, but you still need that base load power. Yeah, of course. Now let's just turn to what you guys are up to at the moment at U308. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about what sets you apart from the rest of the competition. Clearly, we've seen a lot of you know, juniors sort of dust off their, um, you know, their presentation books over the last six months. Um, and, you know, because <laughs> investors are suddenly, yeah. suddenly interested again, what, what, um, yeah, what, what makes you special? So we, we had two projects, uh, one in Argentina and one in, in, in Colombia, and we actually sold the, Argent the, the Argentinian one. We, we felt that the Colombian project was, was big enough that, and, and we should just focus on, on that to do it justice. But, you know, it, it is the most amazing deposit in that it, it's got a peculiar mix of uranium. Uranium would produce about 25% of, of revenue. Um, but the, the uranium is combined with phosphate and nickel and vanadium. And, you know, the, the lithium ion phosphate batteries or the battery that Tesla has moved across to uh, BYD has been using it in China for, for years. And it's the first lithium ion battery to break through that barrier of $100 a kilowatt hour. Um, it, you know, those, those batteries are, are priced at about $80 a kilowatt hour at the moment, and that price is declining. So they, they've been a bit of an ugly duckling in the, in the uh, lithium ion space uh, for, for a while, but now they're breaking through because of their cost and, and their efficiency and they work under low temperatures and that kind of thing. So seeing these major car companies shift across to that is really exciting for us because phosphate would be our, probably our primary um, product. And in fact, in the PEA that we did on the project a while ago, we spend quite a lot of time trying to separate the iron from the phosphate. Now, you know, the, the iron phosphate is actually the, the product that these companies need. And obviously nickel and, and, and vanadium are huge in, in the battery space. So it's, it's, it's a deposit just by its nature is a, is a clean energy deposit, not only on the nuclear or the, or the uranium to drive the nuclear, but also, you know, uh, two thirds of the, um, 
of the revenue would come from these battery commod commodities being phosphate and a nickel and vanadium and it's also got a couple of rare earths in it as well so you know it is it's just simply by nature and we stumbled across it um it, it's it's just an, an incredibly exciting deposit for this um era of, of of clean energy so you know that's what we're going to put all our effort and our money into is developing that project and, and how how are you set for for next year when are we going to see you know next sort of next studies come out and what are your what are your yeah. We we're busy on some metallurgy at the at the moment, and you know actually using water purification systems, reverse osmosis, and that kind of thing to 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 separate the metals, because we think it'll be the most economic way of of, of doing it. Um, you know, capital cost on the project is quite high at the moment; it's about four hundred and sixty million US. But we believe that we can bring that down pretty significantly. And if we if we can achieve that, and those results will be coming through in the next couple of months, in the first quarter of of 2022, uh, that'll start being a you know allowing us to to pencil in by how much that capital cost and in fact the operating costs are are reduced. You know e even with that high capital cost of 450 million. The IRR on the project is about 18%. So it's, you know, it's it's a robust, economically robust project. But if we can drive that those costs down a little bit, get that IRR above 20%, then you know it's it's going to be difficult for anyone to to ignore this project going forward. And it is a big project. So you know, we've we've got a very clear way forward and, and there's going to be lots of news coming out on that. And how are you set for cash at the moment? We've got enough cash just to keep us, um, you know, ticking over. We've we've come out of hibernation as lot uh, a lot, uh, you know, like like most of the other companies. Um, a year ago, no one wanted to talk to us, but we've raised a little bit of cash in in the last year just to carry us through. And um, you know, we'll raise the cash um, that we need going forward in tandem with the results coming out. So I think we're we're well placed to balance the need for cash with, um, you know, with the inevitable dilution that comes with it. But, you know, I think the the dilution will be more than compensated for by what we're adding in, in value to the project. But, you know, that's that's always our, our um, you know, our, our challenge is to make sure that the dilution is justified more than, uh, more than the dilution it's outweighed by the, the the value that we we're adding to to the project, so we, we're going forward um, cautiously, but you know why wisely as uh, as well. Perfect. Okay, Richard. Well, um, I think that's pretty much it from my side. Um, it's been really great to get an overview of your company and what you're up to, and of course of the you know of the sector as well. Um, so yeah, it just remains for me to, to to thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Tom. Really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, I'm sure we will catch up again before too long. But for now, that concludes this video for Mining Journal. Goodbye.